address you know, how to avoid train wrecks with hay feeding and storage. So, yeah, I'll turn them over to you. Thank, th thank you all, and thank you, Dr. Henning. And you know, when they, when they asked me to do this, I, I kind of took some liberty to change it up just a little bit because of the situation of the late summer, early fall drought. So I'm going to throw a little bit of information in here on kind of thinking about how to minimize some of the losses on feeding hay, too, given the situation where a lot of our folks are facing short hay supplies across the state. Sounds like maybe there might be a little bit more hay on this side of the state, so uh, folks are going to be looking for hay and think about uh, opportunities to market that hay if you uh, have excess. I, I want you to think a little bit about um, this picture here, too, and keep it in the back of your mind. Uh, Dr. Halich is, uh, is kind of spearheading a project looking at bale grazing. It's something that's really kind of popular in the Canada and the upper kind of northern plain areas and the Dakotas, Montana, and that area. And so we've had some interest by folks that get popular press articles on bale grazing and have seen maybe a couple of the YouTube blurbs that we've done. Uh, this is Mr. Fred Thomas's place in, in Adair County. He wanted to, to look at bale grazing. And you can see that there's a little bit of damage around the outer edge of the hay bales uh, where the cattle feet uh, can kind of trample that down whenever we get a lot of precipitation or moisture in the wintertime. And we don't ever get rain in the winter here, right? Never. But um, I want you to look at this picture and kind of remember it because I'm going to show you another picture here in the, toward the end of this same farm later in the year. Beef cattle operations, as many of you probably recognize, are, are feeling the pinch financially. Uh, this is from the Minnesota FinBin data. They they take information from the kind of the northern plain states, Minnesota predominantly, and then a few uh, farms out of Iowa and uh, Wisconsin. And I just I've kind of charted here. I know it's hard for you to see, but um, this is from 1996 through 2018, and this is the median farm net income for beef cattle operations. And so you can see that in some years, 2009, 10, 11, when feeder cattle prices were really good and strong, our cow-calf operations were quite profitable. But you know, when we're, we're out here in 15, 16, 17, 18, uh, this is some of the low points in the last 20 years, 22 years. And so uh, even though feeder cattle prices, Dr. Halich uh, mentioned, you know, the, the, the 95 cents to a dollar type range, and we're still at a dollar thirty, dollar thirty five looks good. Um, but when you start thinking about costs and, and feed costs and those things, it's a little bit of a of a downside turn here. And so this makes it a little bit tough for us to think about financial opportunities. Back in the 90s, it was really kind of popular, and, and uh, folks were collecting a lot of data looking at farm financials on beef cattle operations tied in with production information and we called it the standardized performance analysis data sets. And they were done across the U.S. from the, the south all the way up through uh, the Dakotas. And, and Minnesota continues to kind of collect that same information through the FinBin data set. This is, an a, this is the average of 199 beef cow calf operations in their data set. And I just went through and, and pulled out the numbers from 2018. And what I wanted to share with you is if you look at expenditures, and these are not going to include the purchase of the livestock. These are just expenditures in our pasture cost, and then anything that would be stored or purchased feed cost. When you combine these two components that are directly, directly related to feed inputs, they continue to be the majority of the expenditures in our cow-calf operations. This holds true back to the 90s whenever the, the SPA data was looked at because we used to say that it was about 60 to 65 percent of quote-unquote expenses were directly related to feed costs. And so the discussions today that you've heard and will continue to hear throughout the day are really trying to focus on how can we try to minimize uh, losses of expenses and or improve our financial situation on our cow-calf operations. Don't let the rot, rot rob you of potential forage resources. And, and this kind of goes without saying. This is nothing new. I like this picture that uh, my counterpart in Florida, Matt Herson, put together. This is a bale of coastal Bermuda grass. 
Um, but this is a, a bale that's five and a half foot in diameter, supposed to be a five by six, but you all know that sometimes some bales come out a little smaller than others. And so this is a five and a half foot bale. But what's interesting is, is when you start thinking about how much hay it takes to make those last few wraps around that big bale, um, you can begin to see that in the outer six inches, if we were to peel this hay off of the outer six inches of the bale, it can be as much as a third of the weight of the bale. And yet, where's all your spoilage going to occur? Right out there. And so from that standpoint, that kind of lays down this whole next couple of slide sets, we want to try to think about how can we conserve this outer ring of hay. The other thing is to keep in the back of your mind is that if you have a relatively small bale, like four by fours or something like that, and you get excessive amount of spoilage, you really have a greater surface area there um, that's being exposed, and so you wind up with a lot more waste as a quote-unquote percentage of the bale. So if you're going to be in a position where you've got to store hay outside, think about moving to bigger packages because you're going to get this area spoiled. Yes, I understand that's a lot of amount, but then you still wind up with a, a good amount of good hay um, in the middle here that's not going to be damaged by any weathering and some of those things. As you think back through and look at opportunities, um, I put in your notes the table from our um, uh, forage specialist publication on losses, and I kind of put in there um, the differences in, in spoilage rates for exposed or, or hay that's not protected. That's what we're calling exposed here. It's going to get all the precipitation and, and sunlight and anything else potentially could damage it. It's going to get access to. But I like this table from Oklahoma State uh, because it shows differences in kind of the nine months. And in any hay that you might carry over the next year, it goes out and kind of shows you the additional losses you may experience in the next uh, year, nine months to a year. And you can see that in some situations, depending on years, on the amount of precipitation that we get, you could potentially see upwards of half of that bale being lost. And so it's, a, it's an expense to make. You've heard that already. And so how can we try to protect that investment? And so as you move into looking at covering that hay, one of the key things is getting it up elevated off of the ground. And I'll show you some information on that here in a minute. But then also... If we can just get it covered, we significantly reduce the amount of loss just by simply getting it covered, whether that be by a tarp or whether that be by moving it into a barn of some sort. And so one of the things that I tell folks is if, if you're tight on money um, and you're, you're really in a situation where this year you know that you might be tight on hay supplies or the barn is already full, but you want to go ahead and buy hay now, while there's hay available to be purchased and you've got to store it outside, go ahead and buy a tarp as an opportunity to think about protecting that investment that you're making. And if you don't want to spend all the money in an expensive hay tarp, uh, there's a website that you can go and, and look up and buy used billboard signs. These billboard signs today are made out of a vinyl. And it's usually about a six mil vinyl. And so they are repurposing them and they stitch a, a little area down along the bottom of the tarps where you can run PVC through there, then wrap your uh, rope around it and cinch it down underneath your bales. They're about 60% of the cost of a, of a good hay tarp. And so you get what you pay for a lot of times, but if you take care of those, they'll last you several seasons and um, you don't have quite the investment in them as you would a hay tarp. But that's another way to think about in a situation like this if you're going to buy hay and store it outside and you don't want to spend the money for an expensive hay tarp this could be a solution for you as some of these use billboard signs. Now uh, when I was at Wisconsin I had the fortune to work with Dr. Uh, Shinners on some work when one of the new balers were coming out and they were laying plastic in between the net wrap and we were looking at storage and then after it was outside for a while, those hay bales were brought in, and we looked at preference of intake from a group of heifers. And this work is a little different. They put moisture probes in the bales, and they monitored moisture content of these bales. This is a twine wrap bale, and just understand that the red color, we usually think of red as bad, but red is good on these pictures. 
Blue is bad because blue indicates moisture and, and more water. And so when you think about a twine wrap bale, all that moisture is being hit on the surface, generally on the top and the outer edges when we get rainfall. Whatever doesn't penetrate the bale is going to run down out of the side of the bale and go to the bottom, right? And so what this is trying to show us is that if we do something as simple as elevating that bale, getting up on a pallet, getting up on rubber tires, whatever that may be, putting a rock gravel pad down so that the moisture will drain away from that bale, you get a lot less moisture coming up into the bale. These are the same time points on these bales. The only difference is one has the ability for that moisture to move away and not be wicked up into that bale. You know, hay is going to be 12% moisture to 14% moisture. It's still relatively dry and it's going to act like a wick and suck moisture up. And you've seen this when you go in and you pick a bale up that sat through the winter and you see all that bottom part of the bale fall off, all right, that's the reason for that. It's not moving away. The moisture is just simply composting this hay down here at the bottom. Kind of the same work, but they looked at two different bale wrapping techniques. One is our traditional um, twine and then a net wrap. With the net wrap, you're getting more of that hay kind of smashed down and it, it just sheds water a little bit better. And so if you look at the losses of dry matter losses in a bale with a net wrap bale, it's going to be lower than the twine wrap bale. But I know people don't like messing with the, the net because you got to cut it off and then what are you going to do with it, et cetera, et cetera. Please don't feed it to cows. Um, no, you can't throw it in a TMR grinder and just expect it to grind up and get small. If you want to do that, eventually you will have one that you will dissect a big old ball of net wrap out of their gut because it will get stuck. Cut it off, get rid of it. Okay? Hay storage. There's a lot of opportunities for hay storage. It can be a pole shed, something like this. Um, it can be other structures, more like a hoop barn, something of this nature. The key on these are a couple things. They need to breathe. You've got to be able to get moisture going in through those barns and coming out so that they kind of help carry the moisture out. It's dry going in. We get a lot of humidity. We've got a lot of humidity out here today. You need to be able to make sure that that moisture can escape. One of the challenges that we saw when we had um, uh, the work with the hay that was stored outside with a little bit of plastic sheeting over the top of the two-thirds of the bale versus hay that was stored in an airtight barn, the preference was for hay that was stored outside over that that was stored in an airtight barn because there's still some moisture in there, and when you got high humidity, it winds up getting a little bit of a mustiness, moldiness smell to it, and the cattle just didn't prefer that versus bales that were stored in an area where they had good um, air movement across them and when it was dry that they could uh, get that moisture away from them. So think about bales or, or storage that offers these bales an opportunity for moisture to get up here and then get out. You can see the opening back here. You can see the open sides over here. Um, but you're just trying to keep these barns where they're not completely airtight. They've got to be able to breathe, if you will. Put this picture in here, and I just threw it in here because it shows you an example of, of what I call the squats. You know, usually when we go to the gym and we're, we're doing our squats and we're lifting, that's a good thing, right? But in this situation, when you've got bales that perhaps aren't tightly uh, made, see what happens to them. They begin to squat and push down, and that could potentially be a risk of some of these bales falling over or falling out. You can kind of see where these are starting to push their ways out already because the front end's getting to where it's squatting and those next bales are going to start falling and it's an increase of a risk. So you can turn those bales up on the face. If you turn them up on the face and this is down on the ground then, you don't have near the squat on those type of bales, plus you're kind of protecting them and you're protecting the twine and or the net wrap from any mice and small rodents that might run underneath there. And so that's another reason to think about uh, stacking maybe the bottom or two rows and then come in on the top and go this way with them. But that's a, another way to be thinking about some of these issues or challenges when you move hay in to these uh, barns. I prefer a bay type storage system because it doesn't do me a whole lot of good if I've got cattle that are just been weaned off right now and I've got to feed them hay. They're at kind of their lowest nutritional needs, but yet I've got my third cutting hay because it was the last cut and it's right up in the front of the barn and it's the best quality. I'm kind of in a situation where I want to save that hay toward springtime. 
because it's higher quality when that fetus is really growing and the nutritional needs of the cow is much higher. And maybe I got calves that are hitting the ground the end of February, 1st of March before grass comes on. I need that better quality hay then. A bay type of barn allows me the opportunity to come in here and access that different cutting of hay to feed and minimize my purchased input costs. So a bay type, or at the bare minimum, a barn where you can get in on both ends and get first cutting out here and third cutting out here, whatever it may be, is going to give you the opportunity to better match that hay up with the quality needs of the cow and meet her nutritional requirements more from the hay. One thing I should point out that I mentioned the first thing uh, yesterday was the biggest train wreck to avoid starts when you make it. And so what do I mean by that? The biggest issue is it needs to be put up with the proper moisture whether it's for dry hay or whether it's for baleage. And Dr. Henning will go through some of that work on the baleage side. But for dry hay standpoint, last fall as an example, we had a lot of hay that was made October, November. And with the, the short day lengths and the heavy dews that we typically get this time of the year, some of that hay was put up in less than ideal conditions, higher in moisture. And it, A, could go through a heat and caramelize. And when we get caramelized hay, we end up binding up some of the soluble carbohydrates and the protein and we reduce the digestibility and energy values of that forage. 10, 15, 20 percent reduction in, in feed value in caramelized hay. They love it, smells great, they hit it hard, but you're reducing the digestibility of that hay when it goes through that caramelization process. If it's even a little bit higher moisture, which you, which you don't want to see but can happen, and it happened to a lot of hay last year, is it winds up molding and you get a lot of fungal growth and the potential risk of spores, mycotoxin production and some of those things. And if you've ever seen those bales that have been put up marginally wet, they wind up being a dark color and gray and they just got a lot of mold through them. Um, there is some risk of having some things like, uh, the, basically it's an internal hemorrhaging result where there's too much mycotoxins and spores go in the animals and it thins out the small intestine and then eventually it thins it out to the point that it ruptures and they wind up bleeding to death internally. Abortions are a risk with really high levels of mycotoxins and molds as well. So you want to try and minimize the amount of moldy hay that you feed the cows. And so it all starts with that quote unquote baling time and making sure you get the moisture right. And the worst case scenario, the biggest train wreck would be what? With wet hay going into a barn. Spontaneous combustion. Because now you've not only lost all your hay, but you've also lost the barn and any equipment that might have been stored in there that you couldn't get out. So um, those are, I mean, that's the first kind of area to make sure that the train's going to stay on the tracks is at that point. All right, minimizing feeding loss is another thing, thing to think about. We can see situations even higher than this. I wrote in the proceedings paper there was work done back in the 70s at Missouri looking at feeding with or without a hay rack or with or without a hay ring. And in that work, they showed that you could be up to about 40 to 45 percent losses when you just set bales out and you don't protect them in any fashion. So again, when you start thinking about my potential storage losses combined with feeding losses, I could easily be 50 to 60 percent loss simply by how I stored it and how I fed it. It's more common to be upwards of 20 to 30 percent in some of our hay feeding situations with a ring and, and here. Is there any hay that's fallen down here? Significant amount of hay that's going down there, right? And yet one would think that this is a, a good feeder because I can put hay on there and move it across the field or different parts of the farm, but they all don't work the same. And there can be issues when we get, you know, too much hay in here and, and this tray gets full and hay's falling down here. And heaven forbid, it's not going to be bedding. It's going to wind up getting trampled in and it will become organic matter. Uh, but somebody's going to have to come in and fix this all up later. The other thing to keep in the back of your mind is poor quality hay. You're going to see more less loss. They don't like sticks. They don't want to eat sticks. And if you're bailing sticks, they're going to leave sticks behind. Okay, so the better the quality hay, the less the loss you're going to have. And, and that's a good example. We have a producer in Lawrenceburg. He's got a nice field, a, a hay field that's got novel fescue and white clover in it. And, and when he gets that second cutting in there, you can go in those bale rings and there won't be any hay left on the ground. They literally lick it up 
It's all gone. And so the comment I'm trying to get you to think about is trying to improve your ability to make higher quality hay that's put up at the right stage is going to help you minimize this hay loss and how much is left left in the rings. You all have seen it. You put a, a bale that's been stored outside for eight to nine months into a hay ring. It's got that four or five inches of rot and they eat all the way through that sucker and there's just that little ring of rot on the outside, right? Yet that could be 20 to 30 percent of your bale volume that's left behind and they didn't want to eat it, okay? So how can we minimize those things? Slanted bars. So you can see here as an example these feeding bars are at an angle like this. It changes their feeding behavior. For instance, when a cow comes in and she puts her head into that feeding rack, she's got to kind of go down at an angle, and then when she's eaten and she wants to pull her head up or back, she's not going to be able to do that because it'll hit that rack. So she'll pull up this way, and then whatever hay that pulls out of the barn that's not in her mouth hopefully will fall back down into the hay feeding ring or into the trailer versus a straight up and down vertical one where that cow could potentially just go up like this and take a step back as she pulls it, anything that's falling then could potentially fall out here on the ground and get trampled in. So we know from the work, having kind of that slanted bar design will minimize hay feeding losses because we're changing the behavior on how they pull their heads out. Rings need to be managed. Believe it or not, there are bales in here. Here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, etc. This is what I would say of bale grazing gone bad. Okay? And so this is not what we want to see because there's going to be a, a whole lot of litter left back down here that is going to take a long time to decay and, and decompose uh, over time. And you're really not going to get much to establish there. So you're going to have to burn it off or rake it off or whatever. This is more of a conventional type of a hay ring, and you can see that this is a little bit better than some of them. There's, there's bars that are welded in here around the bottom, but it's still open, and you can still see quite a bit of hay that falls out around the bottom. This is a bigger risk on concrete feeding situations because as that ring gets a little empty and those cattle come in and they push against that ring, it begins to move. And as that ring moves, that whatever hay that was down there, they wind up just stepping on. And once they get a little fecal matter on it, they're not going to eat it anyways. So if you're doing a, um, looking at more of the newer hay feeding saving type of feeders, there's the cones that elevate the bales up off of the, the ground. These are what we would call as the tapered feeders. They kind of taper down in the middle and then taper back out. And the hope here is, is that that bale is offset in toward the middle a little bit more. As they eat that hay and they pull it out, it's going to fall within the ring. Okay, It's Friday night. The hay is, bale is essentially gone. The ring is full. And I throw another bale in there because I'm running off to the football game and I won't be back till Sunday. If you do that, what we have found is that down here in the ring, there can be as much as a third of the weight of the bale still in there. And if it's good quality hay, what's going to happen when I put that new bale in on top and the ring is full? Where's the hay going to go? It's going to spill back out over the edges because the ring has already been full. And so whatever potential hay saving opportunity you had with this design has been diminished because of the way you manage the rings. If it's full of the rotten hay, go ahead and pick the ring up and move it to a different situ a place or pick it up, scrape that off onto your stack pad and let it set and put your new bale in there because if this thing is managed where it's full all the time, it will just flow out. Here's an example. The, that was with cows. This is up at the Eden Shell Farm on concrete with the calves. And I hope you can just kind of see, you don't see any of the shiny concrete like you do here. And so when we scraped the concrete off and tried to account for the hay losses, in that situation we were about 20%. When I was up north, when uh, Dan Buzzkirk finished up his work and published it on the cone feeders, we had some of the companies donate those feeders and we looked at them. We saw 30 to 35% improvement. And so, you know, if you can conserve a third of a bale of hay, that's pretty significant when hay shortage or hay stocks are low. And so some of these things, you know, they, yeah, they cost a little bit more, but it's an offset of feeding costs. 
These things are usually made of a little heavier gauge steel too, and so the life expectancy, is, as long as you don't drop hay bales on them, um, is going to be a lot longer as well. How about unrolling hay? A lot of our folks like to unroll hay. I like the idea of unrolling hay because you're distributing the nutrients across the field. Um, the challenge with it is, is that cows lay down on it. What's the first thing they do when they get back up? Lift that tail. And as soon as they defecate or urinate on it, they don't want to eat it. Also, if it's really wet like it is today and they walk across it, they're going to trample it down in the mud. You can see 10 to 12 percent losses in this Canadian work where they were feeding out on the ground up on the snow. If they ground it and process it, because that's the new thing that people are interested in, well, I'll just take this junky old fescue hay, and as long as I grind it up, it's going to be good. That doesn't work that way. Um, you may mask it, but you haven't removed any of the toxins or any of the moldy feed. And the other thing is, is if you've ever seen one of these ran, there's a lot of dust, so there's a lot of shatter loss. And that shatter loss and the really small particles fall down in between the grass and that that the cattle can't pick up. And so there's actually greater feeding losses when we're processing it. If you're going to process it, process it and put it in tires or bunks or something like that where you contain it and the cattle can come in there and lick that up and get almost all those fines cleaned up. North Dakota followed up on that work that came out of Canada. What they did is they looked at the cone feeders. So they set the waste on the cone feeders at zero. There was about 5 or 6% feeding loss with the cone feeder, but they said that's par. Okay, That's going to be our baseline. So then they looked at how much additional loss did they see whenever they unrolled hay. And so they saw another 4 to 5% loss. So if you take 6% from the cone feeder plus another 5% from unrolling it, that's 11% total loss. Does that make sense? Same thing, right? And I think you probably heard this morning, Jim said that they usually assume about 10% feeding loss on unrolling hay as well uh, in his operations. Processing hay, 15% plus another 5 or 6 puts you up close to 20%. Plus, you got to feed every day. You got a piece of equipment that you bought. You got to run a tractor every day. And is your time worth anything? And so those are some of those things to be thinking about. Everybody um, knows that this came out of Tennessee and um, because we don't ever have farms that look like this here. But in all reality, um, Greg mentioned this and, and Dr. Halich mentioned this in his talk this morning. Are we maximizing the use of any fertility that was deposited down here in this situation? We're really not, are we? Are you going to go in there and scrape that mud up and then redistribute it? Nope. So if you have sacrifice areas, think about working and getting an engineered pad, a stacked pad along with it so that you can scrape that over and then apply those nutrients back out. Um, otherwise, think about other ways or methods to try and distribute feeding across the fields and and it may mean that you got to invest in some structures, waters mostly, um, but in most situations you'd be surprised. In the wintertime, the, the water intake is not nearly as, as high as it is in other situations, so we can manage winter feeding a little bit better uh, from a water standpoint. But, but this is what we're trying to minimize and trying to improve throughout the feeding. The, the issues that we ran into last year um, are a lot related to the precipitation we got and then trying to to increase the amount of energy that it takes to get cows to walk through mud. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later if we've got time. Restricting time access when we have limited hay availability. In other words, don't give the cows 24 hour access to hay. Got to have ample feeding area, ample space that all the timid cows can get in there and compete for hay because you're giving them a shorter period of time to eat. Don't restrict replacement heifers. They're still trying to grow. Don't restrict time access for young cows. And don't restrict access to any thin cows that maybe you've just weaned off that need to put a condition score or two back on before next calving season. And never, ever restrict time access for lactating cows. They are producing milk, and you want them to produce milk, and it takes groceries to produce milk. And so don't restrict time access on those. Where does it work then? 
cows that we've just weaned off that are in good condition, right? Cows that we just weaned off that are in good condition. That's where it works the best. Here's the Purdue data that kind of started this discussion. This is time of four hour access, eight hour access, 12, and then 24 hour access. And this is hay disappearance. And you just see that the more time that they have access to hay, the more hay that disappears. But after eight hours, body weight change was not any different. So if they weren't increasing body weight, but hay disappearance was going up, where was it going? Down on the ground somewhere, okay? And so with this is the foundational information on young cows, why we don't restrict young cows. These are your second calf, three-year-old cows that are still trying to grow to mature weights. Same response, the longer access, the more hay disappearance. But look what happened to weight gains. Okay, so they're still trying to grow. They need the groceries to grow. <laughs> Illinois followed up on this work uh, about two decades later. Three hours of access, six hours, nine hours, or 24. Just pay attention to the green bars, which is hay disappearance, just like the Purdue work. But then the yellow bars is actually intake. And once these cattle got more than six hours of access to hay, intake really didn't change. You changed their feeding behaviors. They got in there. They got their business done. They weren't trying to go in here and get a mouthful, run around on this side of the hay ring, get the mouthful, run around on the back side and get a mouthful. Because hay disappearance is increasing, but intake is not changing. Where is it going? To waste. Okay? So there are, there are opportunities to change behavior and improve forage utilization by feeding. This is a follow-up um, on the bale grazing. Remember this slide from the beginning? Good manure distribution. Bale spacing is about 40 by 40. 40 feet in between, 40 feet in between. We tried it one year much closer than that, and we tore the pastures all up. Okay? Could even be 60 by 60, depending on what your goals are and what kind of rain we get. He measured the loss of production. The agent and him worked together. They put cattle panels up around the bales, and they looked at how much forage they lost in this area compared to the areas that they did not do the bale grazing in. They found that in that first year, they lost about a third of the production due to the damage around the hay feeding areas. This is that same area later in the year. You can just barely see the damaged areas, right? So they will recover with time, but it's probably not going to be in that first year. It's probably going to take that season for them to recover. But this producer, within one year of doing this, saw the changes in his soil fertility levels because there's a lot of nutrients that you learned about already in those hay bales. So a few tips. It's ideal for frozen ground or well-drained soils, upland soils. Don't do this along the creek bottoms that are not going to drain very well. Adequate numbers of bales to put out are important, but don't put out everything that you normally would. Mr. Thomas fed a third less hay than he typically had, and he put the same numbers out that he normally fed and had a lot of hay left. And so he had to bring that hay that had set out all winter back in off of the fields. And so you had some losses. So maybe get you enough hay out there to get you through February and then go back and when the, uh, you need to put a little bit more hay out if you're going to do something like this. Bale feeding on a round bale should be less than three days so that it's cleaned up. And usually we're looking at one bale per about 10 head to try and minimize so you don't have 16, 18 cows coming around there at one time and really tearing things up and trying to compete and waste a lot of hay by, as they're competing. Okay. Think time wise, am I okay? Yep. Any Good. Okay, any quick questions? Awesome. Oh, thank you, Dr. Jones. We'd love to see you at the efficiency conference. We've got a really good lineup of speakers coming in to talk about uh, the impacts of late gestation nutrition and how to get these calves off to a good start and keep them healthy. Uh, we've got the, the person that designed the Sandhills um, 
calving system where cattle are continually being moved to try and minimize exposure to pathogens from the cows, to try and prevent scours and some of those things. So we'd love to see you there. Again, it's um, that morning before uh, the KCA convention kicks off. We start at about 8, 8.30. We'll be wrapped up before noon. Um, it's still free, but uh, if you want, you can get a combination pass to go into the trade show and have lunch in at the trade show and visit with the folks that are going to be there. So we'd love to see you there. Yeah, the PVC hay rings are nice. You know, they, they got a little bit wider edge around the bottom of them, and so they don't sink in the mud nearly as easy. Um, the downside on those is they usually come first with the open bottom, but you can buy the plastic that you can drill in around the bottoms and seal them up, and that's typically what I have folks do. All you got to do is screw that plastic in on the into that PVC, and you'll minimize or reduce your amount of losses that way. Yep, good question. Good, good question, and I don't know that I've ever done the break-evens on that, Greg. Good question, because we need to look at how much hay we potentially are going to save versus the cost of the ring, and, and then you got to say, okay, well, what's the potential, the nutrients that I'm leaving behind in the bale and what it's contributing in that, and then what's the loss of forage potential production? It's a, where's Hallich? Because that would be something I'm going to need his help on, because that's bigger than my mind can work. Um, I do know, Greg, that it begins depending on what you pay for the hay savers. I had class do that. And you certainly probably can't pay a thousand bucks for a ring feeder because you simply don't save enough hay at normal prices. If you're in a drought situation where hay is costing $150 a ton and that, that's a different ball game, right? And so in most years I'd say that the hay saver rings, there's no way you can pay probably $1,000 for them, even with a longer life expectancy and the hay savings, because it's just too big of an investment.